Order. Order. Before I call the Prime Minister, I should like to inform the House that at 11 a.m. I shall invite colleagues to rise and observe three minutes silence in memory of those who lost their lives in the tragic events in the United States this week. Order. Statement. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, sir, I'm grateful that you agreed to the recall of Parliament to debate the hideous and foul events in New York, Washington and Pennsylvania that took place on Tuesday, the 11th of September. I thought it particularly important in view of the fact that these attacks were not just attacks upon people and buildings, nor even merely upon the United States of America. These were attacks on the basic democratic values in which we all believe so passionately and on the civilized world. It is therefore right that Parliament, <clears throat> the fount of our own democracy, makes its democratic voice heard. There will, of course, be different shades of opinion heard today. That, again, is as it should be. But let us unite in agreeing this. What happened in the United States on Tuesday was an act of wickedness for which there can be no justification. Whatever the cause, whatever the perversion of religious feeling, whatever the political belief, to inflict such terror on the world, to take the lives of so many innocent and defenseless men, women, and children can never, ever be justified. Let us unite, too, with the vast majority of decent people throughout the world in sending our condolences to the government and the people of America. They are our friends and allies. And we, the British, are a people that stand by their friends in times of need, tragedy, and trial. And we do so without hesitation now. The events themselves are sickeningly familiar to us. Starting at 8.45 US time, two hijacked planes were flown straight into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York. Shortly afterwards, at 9.43, another hijacked plane was flown into the Pentagon in Washington. At 5 past 10, the first tower collapsed. At 10.28, the second, later another building at the World Trade Center. The heart of New York's financial district was devastated, carnage, death, and injury everywhere. Around 10.30, we heard reports that a fourth hijacked aircraft had crashed south of Pittsburgh. I would like, on behalf of the British people, and I hope on behalf of the House, to express our admiration for the selfless bravery of the New York Emergency Services and the American yeah. Emergency yeah. Services, many of whom have lost their lives. As we speak, the total death toll is still unclear, but it amounts, we know, to several thousands. And because the World Trade Center was the home of many big financial firms and because many of their employees are British, whoever committed these acts of terrorism will have murdered at least 100 British citizens, maybe many more. Murder of British people in New York is no different in nature from their murder here in the heart of Britain itself. In the most direct sense, therefore, we have not merely an interest, but an obligation to bring those responsible to account. To underline, Mr. Speaker, the scale of the loss, we could think back to some of the appalling tragedies this House has spoken of in the recent past. We can recall the grief of the tragedy at Lockerbie, in which 270 people were killed, 44 of them British. In Omar, the last terrorist incident to lead to a recall of Parliament, 29 people lost their lives. Each life lost a tragedy, each one of these events a nightmare for our country. But the death toll we are confronting here is of a different order. In the Falklands War, 255 British servicemen perished. During the Gulf War, we lost 47. So in this case, we're talking about a tragedy of epoch-making proportions. And as the scale of this calamity becomes clearer, I fear that there will be many a community in our own country where heartbroken families are grieving the loss of a loved one. I've asked the Secretary of State to ensure that everything they need by way of practical support for them is being done. Here in Britain, we have instituted certain precautionary measures of security. We've tightened security measures at all British airports. 
and ensured that no plane can take off unless their security is assured. We have temporarily redirected air traffic so that planes do not fly over central London. City Airport is reopening this morning. We have also been conscious of the possibility of economic disruption. Some sectors like the airlines and insurance industry will be badly affected. But financial markets have quickly stabilized. The oil producers have helped keep the oil price steady. And business is proceeding as far as possible as normal. So there are three things which we must now take forward urgently. First, we must bring to justice those responsible. Rightly, President Bush and the United States government have proceeded with care. They did not lash out. They did not strike first and think afterwards. Their very deliberation is a measure of the seriousness of their intent. They, together with allies, will want to identify with care those responsible. This is a judgment that must and will be based on hard evidence. Once that judgment is made, the appropriate action can be taken. It will be determined, it will take time, it will continue over time until this menace is properly dealt with and its machinery of terror destroyed. But one thing should be very clear. By their acts, these terrorists and those behind them have made themselves the enemies of the entire civilized world. Their objective, we know. Our objective will be to bring to account those who have organized, aided, abetted, and incited this act of infamy. And those that harbor or help them have a choice, either to cease their protection of our enemies or be treated as an enemy themselves. <laughs> Secondly, this is a moment when every difference between nations, every divergence of interest, every irritant in our relations should be put to one side in one common endeavor. The world should stand together against this outrage. NATO has already, for the first time since it was founded in 1949, invoked Article 5 and determined that this attack in America will be considered as an attack against the alliance as a whole. The UN Security Council on Wednesday passed a resolution which set out its readiness to take all necessary steps to combat terrorism. From Russia, China, the European Union, from Arab states, from Asia and the Americas, from every continent of the world has come united condemnation. This solidarity must be maintained and then translated into support for action. Mr. Speaker, we do not yet know the exact origin of this evil. But if, as appears likely, it is so-called Islamic fundamentalists, we know that they do not speak or act for the vast majority of decent law-abiding Muslims throughout this world. I say to our Arab and Muslim friends, neither you nor Islam is responsible for this. On the contrary, we know you share our shock at this terrorism. And we ask you as friends to make common cause with us in defeating this barbarism that is totally foreign to the true spirit and teachings of Islam. And I would add that now more than ever, we have reason not to, to let the Middle East peace process slip still further, but if at all possible, to reinvigorate it and move it forward. Thirdly, whatever the nature of the immediate response to these terrible events in America, we need to rethink dramatically the scale and nature of the action the world takes to combat terrorism. We know a good deal about many of these terror groups, but as a world, we have not been effective at dealing with them. And of course, it is difficult. We are democratic. They are not. We have respect for human life. They do not. We hold essentially liberal values. They do not. As we look into these issues, it is important that we never lose sight of our basic values. But we have to understand the nature of this enemy and act accordingly. 
Civil liberties are a vital part of our country and of our democratic world. But the most basic liberty of all is the right of the ordinary citizen to go about their business free from fear or terror. That liberty has been denied in the cruelest way imaginable to the passengers aboard the hijacked planes, to those who perished in the trade towers and the Pentagon, to the hundreds of rescue workers killed as they tried to help. So we need to look once more, nationally and internationally, at extradition laws and the mechanisms for international justice, at how these terrorist groups are financed and their money laundered, and the links between terror and crime, and we need to frame a response that will work and will hold internationally. For this form of terror knows no mercy, no pity, and it knows no boundaries. And let us make this reflection too. A week ago, anyone suggesting that terrorists would kill thousands of innocent people in downtown New York would have been dismissed as alarmist. Yet it happened. We know that these groups are fanatics capable of killing without discrimination. The limits on the numbers that they kill and their methods of killing are not governed by any sense of morality. The limits are only practical and technical. We know that they would, if they could, go further and use chemical, biological, or even nuclear weapons of mass destruction. We know also that there are groups or people, occasionally states, who will trade the technology and capability of such weapons. It is time this trade was exposed, disrupted, and stamped out. We have been warned by the events of the 11th of September, and we should act on this warning. So there is a great deal to do Many details to be filled in, much careful work to be undertaken over the coming days and weeks and months. We need to mourn the dead and then act to protect the living. Terrorism has taken on a new and frightening aspect. The people perpetrating it wear the ultimate badge of the fanatic. They are prepared to commit suicide, to die in pursuit of their beliefs. Our beliefs are the very opposite of those of the fanatics. We believe in reason, democracy, and tolerance. And these beliefs are the foundation of our civilized world. They are enduring, they have served us well, and as history has shown, we have been prepared to fight when necessary to defend them. The fanatics should know that we hold our beliefs every bit as strongly as they hold theirs. And now is the time to show it. Yeah. Yeah. Ian Duncan Smith. Mr. Speaker, may I start by thanking you for the opportunity to uh, make this statement today. And on behalf of the official opposition, may I thank the Prime Minister for making his statement this morning. The Prime Minister is to be congratulated on responding to this crisis quickly and resolutely and in giving a lead to other nations who value freedom and democracy. We are party politicians here in a stable democracy and as such we are used to the cut and thrust of political debate here and outside. Yet we are also, as the Prime Minister has made clear, the guardians of a set of values that are underpinned by that democracy and the rule of law. It was those values that were attacked with such callous and brutal ferocity and contempt for human life in New York and in Washington on Tuesday. That is why we come together united in this House in our determination not just to extend our genuine and heartfelt sympathy for the United States, but also to defend the civilized values against those who seek to bring them down by violence. The people of the United Kingdom 
who have themselves stood firmly against terrorism for so many years will at this time expect nothing less of us than to rise above party politics. So at the outset, I have absolutely no hesitation in giving the Prime Minister my party's full support for his immediate pledge to stand shoulder to shoulder with our strongest friends and allies in the United States. Together, we must ensure that the perpetrators are hunted down and, as he said, brought to justice. Over the next, next few days and weeks, there may be some who counsel caution over the full measure of support that the Prime Minister has already announced. In contrast, I would like to say and to assure the Prime Minister that he, throughout, will have our total backing in maintaining his position of unflinching support for the United States in its search for the perpetrators and subsequent actions. As the NATO Secretary General, Lord Robertson, rightly said the other day, an attack on one is an attack on all. And I'd also like to put on record how strongly I congratulate him in invoking Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty. We now have an opportunity to support the United States in the defense of freedom and democracy as they have been prepared to do with us in the past. And I would also like to join the Prime Minister in sending our heartfelt condolences to the American people and specifically to those whose loved ones have been killed or injured in this terrible and sickening series of atrocities. The thoughts and prayers of the entire House and I believe the entire nation are with all of those who are suffering. The sheer horror of what took place on Tuesday <coughs> is virtually impossible to comprehend, as is the evil of people who would commit such acts against fellow human beings, indeed against humanity itself. For me, this was brought starkly home when I learned that not only those in the planes and buildings had perished, but also hundreds of emergency workers as they selflessly sought to save the lives of others. One of the most moving and poignant images in today's press is of a fireman running up the stairs as others were coming down in the opposite direction, fleeing for their lives. Sadly, it seems he may well have lost his life too, but nothing better illustrates the courage and unfailing sense of duty that he and so many others showed on that day. It's likely to be some time before the final toll of casualties is known. But we do know that it will run into thousands and include people of many different nationalities. We know too, as the Prime Minister has said, as many as one in 10, it appears, who died might well turn out to be British. One in 10, making this the worst terrorist atrocity ever against our own country. Can I also say how much we admire the response of the American people themselves, who have shown a steely determination to carry on with their everyday lives. By their example, as the Prime Minister has referred, they will have demonstrated to the world once again why such cowardly acts of evil will never succeed. <coughs> what has been highlighted in the most graphic and awful terms possible is the changing nature as the Prime Minister said, of the threat to freedom and democracy that we now face. I agree with the Prime Minister that we need urgently to assess how individually and collectively we respond to that. And I welcome the Prime Minister's commitment to review the laws against terrorism, including the worrying links with organized crime. Furthermore, is it not the case that Tuesday's attacks have also shattered the dangerous notion that after the end of the Cold War, the United Kingdom and others would no longer face any direct threats. Whether it be from rogue states or terrorists, what Tuesday showed us is that for those who are prepared to carry out such threats, there are no limits to what they will do. No weapons they will not use and no life they will not sacrifice. For them, terror has become 
an end in itself. For the rest of us, as one leading British Muslim put it, the loss of one innocent life is the equivalent of the loss of humanity. I would like to take this opportunity to associate myself with the Prime Minister when he said, Islam is not responsible for this barbarism. Yeah. Now, some people have said that Tuesday changed the world forever. But what should not have changed is our way of life, based on our cherished freedoms and democracy, and the strength of our resolution to defeat those who seek to destroy it. Mr. Speaker, the terrorist outrage we saw on Tuesday have shaken the entire world. It is now the responsibility of civilized countries everywhere to do whatever is necessary to prevent such attacks ever happening again. On many occasions in the past, Britain and the United States have stood resolutely together in the defense of freedom and democracy. That is a testimony to the shared values and friendship between our two countries. We stand by them not because of Article 5, but because they are our allies and our friends. President Bush has described Tuesday's outrage as an act of war. He was right. This was an act of war. And now the message needs to go out loud and clear. Those governments that harbor terrorists will have to learn to live with the consequences of their actions. Today, somber yet determined, we affirm once again our solidarity and our unity of purpose. Terrorism, wherever it rears its evil head, will never succeed, and democracy must always triumph. First of all, Mr. Speaker, can I um, congratulate the Right Honourable Gentleman on, his, on the position that he has uh, attained in his party and welcome him to the dispatch box? Uh, um, I should think, like me, he would prefer this not to have been the first occasion that, that uh, we face each other across the dispatch box, but I do sincerely congratulate him in his position. And can I thank him unequivocally, too, for the support that he has um, given us today, and I think that is both important and, and, and immensely welcome. The points that he, he, he raises, I think we are really fully in agreement with. Perhaps I would, I would simply add this. I think what is important now is to see this, as it were, in, in, in two parts. The first is the, the immediate response, uh, the response to the act of terrorism that is being carried out and how we bring those responsible to account. And then I think there is further work over time which is, if you like, almost to draw up an agenda for the international community of action that can be taken um, in our individual countries, collectively at an international level, in order to defeat terrorism around the world. And I think that is an agenda in which it's important that we as a country, and not just uh, the government, but also um, people of all political persuasions in the country, work together on, in order that we can provide um, the details that are going to be necessary on areas like extradition, the financing, money laundering, and so on. There is a whole, I think we're very well aware, a whole network of, of complicity, frankly, in the work of terrorism around the world. And I think quite apart from the response to this, this immediate outrage, it is necessary now to, to, to use this in order to devise the right agenda to tackle this wherever it is, um, right around the world. And his support today is, is, is much appreciated in that regard. Charles Kennedy. Mr. Mr. Speaker, sir, could I, on behalf of my uh, honorable and right honorable friends in the Liberal Democrats, uh, completely uh, associate ourselves with the very proper sentiments that have been expressed so well by the Prime Minister and by the new leader of the Conservative Party, whom I congratulate, although in very sad circumstances, upon his, uh, his appointment, his election, um, over the breathtaking uh, nature of the savagery that we have witnessed uh, in the United States and which for so many of us uh, will have affected so many of our constituents and communities up and down the breadth of our land, never mind the United States or the wider international community. I say this, we all have a heavy heart today. Uh, as I was listening to the Prime Minister, I was thinking back to uh, history days and John Bright, in very different circumstances, once speaking in the House of Commons, 
spoke about how there was a sense that the angel of death was floating above the chamber. Well, I think the angel of death is very much with us today. There is no doubt about that. I spent one of the happiest years of my life uh, as a student in the Midwest of the United States. And what I didn't understand as a pretty regular visitor back and forward to New York in the 20 years or so since then, what I didn't understand until I became a student in the United States was how Midwest America, I was in Indiana, feels so divorced from East Coast America and West Coast America. Speaking to friends, including one who worked in that building and was transferred just before the summer further down Wall Street and was therefore not afflicted uh, by this terrible tragedy just in the last day or two. What is absolutely remarkable is the extent to which, and we must not underestimate this as a country ourselves on the other side of the Atlantic, the extent to which middle America, East Coast America, and West Coast America is like that. It is as united as never before. And we have to understand, therefore, and comprehend the scale of the shock and the unity that that shock has brought about uh, for that great continent and that great country. Yesterday afternoon, in common with the Conservative Party leader, the Prime Minister, the former Conservative Party leader, uh, and others uh, in this house, uh, I went to sign the condolence book in Grosvenor Square. It was quite remarkable uh, reading the sentiments that had been expressed there was the bouquet of flowers from a Polish ex-serviceman in the Second World War, now domiciled in London. There was the family from Dagenham, uh, who had no connections with the United States whatsoever, but just wanted to say we're so sorry. There were the American tourists here in London, bereft because they don't know what's happened to people whom they know, perhaps family or loved ones, and they are without information. And I think that this scale of tragedy is in itself a great opportunity. And I think the Prime Minister is absolutely correct. This is the moment for the international community to get its act together in a better way and certainly a different way. And what I would want to uh, ask the Prime Minister, this is not the occasion for, I quite agree, party political debate, but how does he see uh, these international bodies to which we are such a significant subscriber actually beginning to organize their decision making, their capacity to govern uh, intelligence services and the acts of these people who would perpetrate uh, such dreadful deeds uh, in a way which is going to be more effective and more efficient? Does he see that through the G8, for example, with its intelligence capacity there? Does he see it more through the United Nations, for example? What role might the European Union have to bring to bear in such a development? It would be a welcome one. Secondly, can I very much underscore what the Prime Minister and the leader of the Conservative Party has said about the importance of all of us sending the correct and the legitimate signal to the Muslim community within Britain. There is not an argument to be had here, and woe betide anyone in a position of influencing public opinion who tries to suggest that there is. I have been rather concerned over the last couple of days the way in which there is a strand of comment and a strand of sentiment uh, beginning to emerge which mixes all of these horrific acts up with the legitimate differences that we have across the parties and so on about asylum seekers, about immigration, about the position of various ethnic communities within our country. It is not about that. And the House of Commons, I think, has got to send that signal defiantly, absolutely defiantly. The final point I would ask the, uh, <coughs> the Prime Minister is, if it proves to be the case, which seems almost now inevitable, that there will be some kind of military response at some point. We may not know where, we may not know when, and at the moment we don't know who. But if that is the case, would he confirm to the House that he does not rule out a further recall of the House 
particularly if British uh, service people are going to be involved in such actions, which I imagine is the case. It was an American writer who once observed that the terrorist attempts to wash an impure world clean with the blood of innocent victims. Well, the impurity here is the dreadful deed of the terrorist, and that is what this house stands shoulder to shoulder on with our American cousins in full support. Um, again, uh, Mr. Speaker, can I thank him for his support? And I think the, um, the sight to, to people not just here, but but in America and around the world, of the main political parties standing together on this issue is, is a message that they will welcome and find immensely reassuring. Um, as for the, the methods that we will try and devise at an international level to deal with, with terrorism, I think it, it happened, it, this is an agenda to be taken forward literally in every international forum there is. There is, of course, discussion underway now about a new convention on terrorism that we've been working on for some time with other countries. Uh, the G8, of course, will have a role to play, um, as will other bodies of which we are, are members. I think the most important thing, though, is not to forget the sheer horror of what has happened and let that inspire us to take the action that is now necessary. Because I do think it is important to realize uh, that there are other methods and other forms of terrorism that could increasingly become open to these terrorist groups. And now is the time to make sure that we're putting in place the measures that allow us to have the best chance of stopping it. I agree entirely, obviously, with what he says about the Muslim community. And, of course, I certainly don't rule out uh, the further recall of, of, of Parliament and circumstances where that is necessary. Tom Deal. Does the House have the assurance that we ourselves in no way will inflict terror on innocent people, because if we do so, we simply recruit more terrorists. Um, Mr. Speaker, of course, we will act always as a country in accordance with the beliefs that we hold dear, and those beliefs are, in fact, to try to defeat terrorism and to ensure that so far as possible, we are standing up for the rights of democratic and civilized people everywhere to go about their business free from terror. But it is also the case that this act of terrorism does demand a response to bring those responsible to account. And that is something we must pursue, and must pursue not simply in the interests of America. One of the things I have tried to say right from the outset of this terrible event, and it should be brought home to us because of the large numbers of our own citizens that have been killed. And you can only imagine what would happen if a hundred or more, possibly many more, of our own people were killed by an act of terrorism in this country. And yet it is no different in nature, whether it happens in New York anywhere, or if it happens here in Britain. So our interests are directly engaged, and I believe in order to protect the world from further terror, it is necessary to take action. Now we will, as we always do, we'll take action in a considered and calm and careful way, but action will have to be taken. David Trimble. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I, first of all, on behalf of my colleagues in the Ulster Unionist Party, and I think on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland generally, uh, ex associate myself with the comments the Prime Minister has made expressing our condolences to the American people and to all of those who have been uh, bereaved and injured <coughs> in the events uh, of the last few days. Uh, may I also uh, underline and agree with the comments made by the Leader of the Opposition which he pointed out that what we've seen is actually uh, the worst act of terrorism inflicted on the British people uh, in, since the last war, in effect. And it is quite right, therefore, that we should very seriously, along with our allies, uh, contemplate what should be the appropriate action. There's one other comment that, that comes very much to mind, Mr. Speaker. I recall reading in the media uh, after the event uh, a number of commentators quoting the rather macabre words issued by an Irish Republican spokesman after the IRA had attempted to wipe out the cabinet, in which that spokesman said uh, that you have to be lucky all the time, we only have to be lucky once. What I find unfortunate is that some commentators were quoting that as if it was an accurate comment, which of course it is not. It was a deliberately crafted statement intended to amplify the terror and to give people 
the sense that they were helpless and that terrorism would inevitably succeed. And that is quite wrong. That is quite wrong. And it is important that we, in all we say and do, underline that it is wrong. Terrorism will not succeed. Terrorism can be beaten. Not easily. It requires, of course, very careful intelligence. The leader and the father of the House is right to point out that one wants as far as possible uh, to avoid injury to any innocent people. That is why intelligence is absolutely crucial. But then the correct application of that terrorism, of that intelligence, which of course has to be taken over time. We will of course entirely support the government when it comes to take what the Prime Minister calls appropriate action. But he is quite right to underline that that action has to be determined, that it will take time and continue over time. There won't be a quick fix on this. But it is important that the menace is properly dealt with, and as the Prime Minister says, the machinery of terrorism is destroyed. There's one other specific point in the uh, statement that I would like very much to underline, and that's the need for us to look once more at how we deal with this, and in particular at how terrorist groups are financed and their money laundered. The links between terror and crime are considerable. The links between terrorist organisations are considerable. And this is something we will have to examine very closely and very carefully indeed. And if we can somehow take out these sinews of this terrorist conflict, we will make the task of defeating terror that much easier. Well, uh, again, Mr. Speaker, I agree with everything uh, the right hon. Gentleman said. I thank him for support. And in particular, I agree with him wholeheartedly uh, that we shall ensure that terrorism will not succeed. Khalid Mahmoud. Would the Prime Minister accept my undeserved condemnation of the atrocities carried out in the United States? Would he further accept that the terrible act of terrorism claimed the lives of many people of many faiths, including Muslims? And would he further assure this House that it would be quite wrong for the British Muslims to be tarred with the same brush for this following this dreadful act of terrorism? Thank you. Well, can I thank my honourable friend for his words, and I think that he, he will, will speak uh, on behalf of uh, many Muslims in this country when he says uh, that they share the shock and horror at this outrage. And I think the fact that the, that the Council of British Muslims issued a statement of such strength and so quickly indicates what, what we know to be true, uh, that those that truly follow the religion of Islam are decent, peaceful, and law-abiding people, and that they, like us, uh, have often been victims of this terrorism, and they, like us, want it stamped out. Michael Mates. Referring to part of what the Prime Minister said about future cooperation, uh, would he agree that it's almost inconceivable that some intelligence or security agencies somewhere in the world didn't have wind of an event in which so many people were involved and which took so long to plan? And are we not, here in Britain, perhaps uniquely placed to lead a crusade because of our historical ties in the Middle East, in the Far East, and in the Indian subcontinent? to lead a crusade for better cooperation amongst all the, the security and intelligence organizations in the free world, because they must now realize that all of them are as much as risk as we have been and the Americans are now. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, the Honorable Gentleman has a great deal of experience in, in these issues. I, uh, I can't comment on it, the, the speculation in the first part of his, his question, but I do think the point that he makes is absolutely right. And I think one of the things that has been brought home to people as a result of this, uh, this atrocity is the need for far better cooperation between countries and also, I think, uh, a recognition and a sense that the, the threat to the world today has, has changed since some of the, the very sharp ideological divisions of the Cold War declined. I mean, the threat is in um, new forms of terrorism and fundamentalism um, that can be at one level, to us, utterly irrational in what they do, but in the methods that they pursue can be very coldly rational. And there is a need for far better cooperation between nations, not just in terms of intelligence and security, but in other ways too. And something that has been interesting has been the reaction of the whole of the world to this, from every single corner of the world, from every single type of nation with an interest in order and stability rather than disorder and chaos. I think we need to build upon that now. Louise Elman. Does the Prime Minister accept 
that when the initial horror of the atrocities that have occurred subsides, sophisticated attempts will be made to limit the action that can be taken by trying to link what are regarded by some as just causes with the atrocities that have taken place. And would he agree that such approaches both ignore the fanaticism of those who have carried out these grotesque acts and ignores their unlimited objectives? I agree very strongly with that indeed. And I think there is something we should guard against right at the very outset. I mean, we speak now a few days after this event when the memory of it is still very, very fresh, when we're seeing the consequences of it daily in our newspapers, on our television screens. But we must not let the passage of time in any shape or form dull our determination to carry on with the agenda that we have set out today, bringing those responsible to account and making sure that we then take the action necessary to deal with this, this new phenomenon in, in our world. And I think my honorable friend is absolutely right. Um, and people, of course, one of the, the values that we fight for is the democratic right to disagree. And people are perfectly entitled to have their causes and their feelings about any regime or, or government or system or way of life. But it's up to us to make sure that they are not allowed to pursue those causes in anything other than a peaceful or democratic way. And when we are under threat, and we are under threat um, from these events, it is important that we react and do not allow uh, the passage of time to make us weak in the face of that threat. Sir Brian Mulwiney. Does the Prime Minister accept that he is to be congratulated <coughs> on the instinctive and robust way in which, on behalf of his government, this House and the nation, he has stood with the Americans yeah. and that he has the full encouragement of the House to continue to do that? Yeah. He mentioned the number of British people who will be killed and maimed and hurt as a consequence of this terrible atrocity. Would he make arrangements for his government to be as generous as possible as families may have to go to the United States to identify bodies, <coughs> estates may have to be wound up and possessions brought back, people will need medical care and assistance I suspect that in the circumstances that is his instinctive reaction. It would be helpful if he could say so. Yeah, yeah. I think that is a, a, a very good point, Mr. Speaker, and we are indeed making arrangements to do just what the right honourable gentleman has indicated. John Hume. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I join with the House in expressing our deepest gratitude to the Prime Minister for bringing us all together today so that, as we rarely do, we can all speak with one very clear voice about these terrible atrocities in the United States and in expressing our deepest sympathies to the families of the victims in the United States and our utter and total condemnation of those who have carried this out. And of course, in working together with the United States to bring to justice the people who have, who have carried out these terrible atrocities. And of course, could we reiterate the very important point that the Prime Minister made, that although it appears likely that this was carried out by so-called Islamic fundamentalists, that they, we know that they don't speak or act for the vast majority of decent, law-abiding Muslims throughout the world. And could I say, coming from a region that has experienced terrorism, that I would, uh, that, that, that coming together with the United States government and with other governments across the world to put a stop to the development of terrorism. Because when you look at the statistics of our small part of the world, one out of 500 people have lost their lives. That's the equivalent of 100,000 people on this island. And one out of 50 have been maimed or injured. Uh, and when you consider that's the equivalent of a million people on this island. That's how serious this development of recent years has been. And therefore, it's crucial as we move into the new century and the new millennium, when I presume we had all hoped we were leaving behind us the conflicts of the past and the wars of the past, that every possible positive action should be taken by all democratic governments 
to put to an end this carry-on called terrorism? I think the, the, the point that the right uh, the gentleman makes is, 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 in, is indeed correct. Um, and I hope that one consequence of what has happened is that governments around the world work together far more closely uh, in order to deal with, with what is, I think, now very clearly perceived, though it always was in truth, a common threat. Alex Salmon. Mr. Speaker, the, the House is united in condemning this atrocity, as indeed the Scots Parliament was on Wednesday, and therefore can I associate the Scottish National Party and Plaid Cymru with the remarks of the Prime Minister, particularly those referring to those who have been so devastatingly bereaved yeah. this week. Yeah. Can the Prime Minister accept that there is actually no level of security in a democratic society which can offer total protection against a suicidal fanatic's intent on mass murder? And therefore, an international effort to dismantle <laughs> such organisations is justifiable, it's necessary, and very, very welcome. But will he also say there must be an attempt to dismantle the hatreds on which terrorism breeds? The Prime Minister mentioned a renewed effort for peace in the Middle East. Can he offer the House, even at this stage, any comments on the timescale, structure, hope and expectation of when that international effort will also take place? Of course it is, it is always uh, important. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and first of all, let me thank the Honourable Gentleman for, the, for the, the words of support that he's given. It is always important that we try and do everything we we can to minimize the, the, the causes of such hatreds throughout the world, although I don't think we should ever uh, get into the position, I know he, he, he wasn't, of ever believing that, that the one can ever justify um, the acts of terrorism such as the ones that we've seen. But I, I don't uh, have at the present time um, a set of specific ideas to offer on the way forward in the Middle East peace process, though we remain, as we always do, willing to work with the parties there and with others in order to make sure that, that whatever possibilities there are for peace there are, are, are properly developed. But I do believe it is important um, that as one part of this, we redouble our, our efforts there. And I think the one uh, element of this that, again, comes across very strongly when we, uh, we contemplate what has happened earlier this week is, is just the absolute and vital importance of people understanding that in today's world we are more interdependent and more interlinked than ever before. Um, and that has come across graphically to all of us as a result of the events of this week. But just as we are interdependent in terms of the threats that we face, there is also more that we can do together to try to push forward some of the process of peace and understanding <coughs> necessary in difficult parts of the world. And I think that is true not just in the Middle East but elsewhere as well. Dennis Skinner. Does the Prime Minister agree that there's a world of difference between standing shoulder to shoulder with those American people and the fight for justice than hanging on to the coattails of an American president whose first act when those firefighters were standing 10 feet tall amongst the rubble in the World Trade Center whose first act was to scurry off to his bunker. I'm afraid I, I disagree with my honorable friend very strongly. And in the conversation um, that I had with President Bush, uh, I found him to be absolutely focused, very calm, very determined, and very mindful of the devastation that had been caused his people. And I do believe that it is important that we are standing together with America at this time of need and trial, and that is what we will do. Jonathan Seed. Terrorism is a hydra-headed monster. Whilst the exercise of military might is right, does the Prime Minister accept that military might alone will not be enough? And there has to be some understanding why there is such hatred for the inst so many institutions within the United States. And unless we deal with some of the deep-seated causes, then more terrorists will come to the fore. I think it is important that we, um, that we analyze some of the, the hatreds that the Honorable Gentleman has spoken about and what we can do to, to, to minimize those. Though I do think it is very important 
that we never get ourselves in, in a position of uh, moral ambiguity on this. I mean, there is, no, there is nothing that can ever possibly in any shape or form justify what has taken place. And some of the comments from around the world you know, worry me on that score uh, because you know, people are perfectly entitled to dislike the American way of life. That is their democratic right. Uh, it's not a feeling we ourselves share, but it's a, a feeling people are entitled to have if they want, but they pursue it uh, and whatever changes they wish in a proper and democratic way. Having said that, one of the things that I think is important is that we make common cause with the decent and law-abiding governments and peoples of the Islamic world in combating this threat, because they, of course, uh, are victims of this, this threat also. And I do believe as well that insofar as we can, we move forward the process of peace in the Middle East. So I think there is a, a balanced and sensible view to be taken, but I do emphasize to him that I don't think that we can ever be in any other position uh, than saying what happened in the United States of America cannot have any conceivable shred of justification. It is uh, a barbaric act in respect of which action has to be taken. And yes, of course, we must at the same time look at how we push forward the process of peace and understanding in the world. But that should not draw us back in any shape or form from pursuing those responsible for this atrocity. Paul Marsden. I share a sense of uh, shock and outrage as every other member does in this house at those despicable acts of terrorism. And I praise the, uh, my right honorable friend for his steely determination. But can I inject a, a, a note of caution? That there are American sources now indicating that there could be uh, NATO bombing uh, prepared uh, in Sudan, uh, in Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Afghanistan. And the whole place could go up in a tinderbox in the Middle East if we were not careful. So I would urge him to talk with President Bush and to find the right targets, to find the culprits. But ultimately, we should be acting not out of revenge, but out of a sense of justice. I agree, of course, entirely that we, we act uh, out of a sense of justice. Um, and I, I simply say to my honorable friend and to others not to pay too much attention to some of the wilder pieces of speculation that are, that are inevitably made at a time like this. Um, but what is important is to recognize that the way that the United States of America has proceeded so far is exactly the right way. In a calm and considered way, in close consultation with allies such as ourselves, we have been in the closest consultation and cooperation with them. They are doing this in exactly the right way. And I think it's important that we recognize that and recognize that they, like us, uh, wish to make sure that we base our identification of those responsible on proper evidence, but then we are relentless in our pursuit of those responsible and bring them to justice. Well done. We now come to the main business, the sitting of the House motion. Like to move. The question is as on the order paper. As many as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the country, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Adjournment. Mr Speaker, I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Secretary Straw. Mr. Speaker. Like just interrupt, uh, order, if I can just interrupt. There is an eight minute limit on backbench speeches. Secretary Straw. Mr. Speaker, uh, like my right honourable friend in offering congratulations to the new leader of the opposition in these appalling circumstances, I offer my congratulations to the new Shadow Foreign Secretary the Right Honourable Member for Devises, and express my appreciation for the cooperation which I had from his predecessor, the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Horsham. The whole House, Mr Speaker, has, as we've heard in the last 55 minutes, been united in shock and grief at the events in the United States on Tuesday morning. And today, as so many times before in our shared history, we find ourselves in complete solidarity with our friends and allies in the United States. Our people are inextricably bound together by close ties of family, friendship, language, culture, and above all values. And we all remember that this country's freedom and Europe's freedom, which so often we take for granted, would not exist today without the direct support which the United States gave us twice in the space of 25 years. And the close interconnection between the two societies, our two societies, has been tragically underscored by the large number of British casualties. 
Many right honourable and honourable members present will know of homes in their constituencies where families wait with fading hope for news of loved ones. The tributes have already been paid to the work of the emergency services in New York and Washington, who even now are trying to save lives, having lost theirs. We have no certainty, I regret to say, at this stage about the exact identity of the total number of British casualties. But it is likely to run to hundreds. And with a catastrophe on this scale, it is, however, crucial not to diminish individual tragedies behind the awful aggregate figures. I, like everybody else in this House, have tried to imagine the intense agony of the thousands of people who still wait to hear the fate of their loved ones. We, too, are frustrated that, as yet, there is so little information to give, but we all understand the reasons why this is so. But I can assure the House that the government is doing everything possible to get information to families as soon as we can. Our crisis unit in London, run from New Scotland Yard, staffed 24 hours a day, has dealt with thousands of calls reporting people missing or safe. Our diplomatic posts in the United States have had response units working day and night. A crisis centre set up at our Consulate General in New York is taking calls and contacting companies with offices in or around the World Trade Centre and is passing on all information on British nationals to our staff in London. My right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, has already referred in answer to an intervention from the other side about the assistance which we have already offered to those who have been bereaved and we stand ready to offer. There will be some United Kingdom citizens in the United States with no medical insurance to pay for treatment for their injuries. Given the exceptional nature of the circumstances, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health and I, have agreed that the government will bear their hospital costs. And we are already working on arrangements for the repatriation of bodies and for flights for relatives to go to the United States. Mr. Speaker, these attacks have shocked the world. They have also changed the world. This massive tragedy is an event of huge and almost unparalleled historical significance. Comparisons have been made with the attack on Pearl Harbor. But unlike Pearl Harbor, Tuesday's attacks were directed against thousands of unarmed, innocent civilians and at the very heart of the continent of the United States. And they were launched by an enemy who as yet remains unseen. Now, it's plainly too soon to come to firm conclusions about the consequences of these acts for the global order. But I want to say this. History has presented us with such decisive moments before. Over the last two centuries, each time a conflict has ended, people have come together to try to ensure that the last war really would be the last war. After the First World War, United States President Woodrow Wilson worked for a new world order to try to establish a lasting peace. Yet within a generation, the world was again at war. The structures set in place after 1945 have in every respect been more successful in preventing global conflict for half a century. But these structures, political, military, and legal, were laid down to deal with the last threat of war between states. Our challenge now is to make sure that they're equal to this and to the next threat. And Mr. Speaker, in considering the approach we now take, we would do well this week to draw lessons from the experience of the 1930s. Our predecessors then were so desperate to avoid further military action that they made a huge, if understandable, mistake. They thought that they were dealing with adversaries who shared with them the same basic values, basic rules and assumptions about humans, how humans, even in times of conflict and war, should behave towards one another. And it was not until too late that our predecessors realized that the aggressors were in the grip of a sort of collective political psychosis, that these people did not accept the norms and decencies which the rest of us took for granted. And we all know the consequences of what followed. We have to acknowledge that the people who plotted, organized, and carried out these attacks in New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania on Tuesday were not people who accept any of the rules or values 
which we in the rest of the world would recognize. They have no respect, however minimal, for human life, not even for their own lives. And there has, as my rival friend, the Prime Minister, has made clear, to be a response to this. As he said, the United States rightly is proceeding with deliberation and care. Equally, Mr. Speaker, to turn the other cheek would not appease the terrorists, but would lead to a still greater danger. And we need, in this House, to acknowledge this overwhelming, if dismal, truth if we are to prepare ourselves and our societies in the months and years ahead for the possibility, unpalatable as it may be, of further attacks. And this is not a conflict where nation-state is formally pitted against nation-state. This instead is a deliberate act of war by calculating groups who are formally outside states against the rest of the civilised world. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, the rise of the warlord and the terrorist funded by conflict, drugs and other criminal activity is one of the growing threats which we have faced, particularly since, paradoxically, the fall of the Berlin Wall. NATO has recognised the unprecedented nature of this threat. As we've heard, for the first time in the history of the Alliance, it has invoked Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, which states that an armed attack against one or more of the Allies in Europe or North America shall be considered an attack against them all. There is no clearer signal we could send to the perpetrators of these attacks than that they face a determined and united response by the international community. But in many ways, Mr. Speaker, the unanimous decision on Wednesday by the United Nations Security Council was more important still. The Security Council resolved that not only those directly responsible for what happened at the World Trade Center, but also those indirectly responsible, aiding, supporting, or harboring the perpetrators, organizers, or sponsors of these acts, will be held accountable. And the Security Council expressed its readiness to take all necessary steps to respond to the terrorist acts and to combat all forms of terrorism. And in making such a resolution, and a similar one in the General Assembly, we see that the whole of the international community is united in its determination to respond. Of course, Mr. Speaker, we have to develop our defences against a repeat or copycat attack. It would be deeply irresponsible not to do so. But we also need to focus our attention on where the next threat to our collective security will come from. And it should now be obvious to everyone that people who have the fa fanaticism and the capability to fly an airliner laden with passengers and fuel into a skyscraper will not be deterred by human decency from deploying chemical or biological weapons, <laughs> missiles or nuclear weapons, or other forms of mass destruction if these are available to them. And so we have to redouble our efforts to stop the proliferation and the availability of these weapons. And, Mr. Speaker, at the same time, we have to intensify our traditional methods of diplomacy to bring some good out of this evil. We must not be deflected from our attempts to resolve conflicts, to diffuse tensions, to work for peace, in the troubled regions of the world, whether this be the Balkans, the Middle East, or elsewhere. For it's the terrorists who, above all, want all of these efforts to fail. But it is, Mr. Speaker, no longer tolerable that any states should harbour or give succour to terrorists. The international community must unite as never before to take determined collective action against the threat that failing and failed states pose to global security. And nor can we allow any longer the borders between democratic nations and the gaps between our respective domestic jurisdictions to be exploited so ruthlessly in courts of law by those who reject the rule of law. Yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, with my European Union colleagues, 
I have this week agreed the first steps towards a common policy on terrorism. We need to consider what further action we can take collectively on issues, as the Prime Minister has said, like extradition, proscribing terrorist organisations, as we have done in the United Kingdom, and thwarting and planning and funding of terrorist organisations. Terrorists, very briefly. As far as the funding of, of terrorism is concerned, is he aware that there are still obviously a number of, of extremist Middle East organisations in London fundraising and peddling evil, for example, like Sheikh Abu Hamza, based at the Finsbury Park Mosque, and also is he aware that Bin Laden's sister I is living in this country? Well, I, I say to the uh, Honourable Gentleman that, of course, um, I'm aware of the presence of the individual of which he spoke. One could hardly fail to be aware of him. But as so many uh, members in their interventions made clear, particularly my uh, honourable, honourable friend, he does not speak for the Islamic faith or the Islamic community. As to what action is to be taken, it was only last year that we passed into law in this House the Terrorism Act, which greatly strengthens the tools available uh, to the police and the courts to deal with such people who are raising funds or support for terrorist organisations. Mr Speaker, one of the things we need to remember, but we also need to remember that when those bills were brought, that bill and the Investigative Powers Bill were brought before this House, there were some people who claimed they went too far and were not proportionate to the threat of terrorism. We have, I think, been reminded this week of the strength and the potential power which terrorism poses to us. And we have, in a way which properly balances liberties with the freedom to live, to ensure that we respond effectively to those and mounting threats. Terrorists operate without regard for borders. The fight against terrorism therefore needs to be a global one. And only a true coalition of the civilised world offers a real chance of cutting out this cancer. And as we construct this coalition, we will include the Islamic world. No one should be in any doubt. These acts of murder, of mass murder, have nothing to do with the Islamic faith. As the Muslim Council of Britain has said in its strong condemnation of the atrocities, these are senseless and evil acts that appall all peoples of conscience. Mr. Speaker, we admire the calm determination and dignity with which America's leaders and the American people have reacted to this calamity. We've offered them our full backing for their efforts to hunt down and to hold to account the terrorists and those who harbour them. There must be no refuge. These were not just attacks on the United States, attacks instead on humanity, on civilization, on us all. The terrorists who struck on Tuesday have exploited what they see as the great weakness of democratic societies, freedom. But in truth, freedom is and will remain our greatest strength. Terrorism is ultimately self-defeating, and we have to channel the rage and revulsion which we feel today to make intelligent decisions in order to ensure the triumph of the civilized values on which this House is founded. And from this catastrophe, I believe that the United States and the free world will emerge stronger. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, may I start by thanking the Foreign Secretary for his speech and for his kind remarks. I only wish that we could have uh, met first across this dispatch box in happier circumstances. May I also pay tribute to my predecessor, the Right Honourable Member for Horsham, my Right Honourable Friend, for the way that he conducted his uh, administration of this shadow portfolio. His wisdom and judgment is something that I hope I too will be able to emulate in the weeks and months ahead. We meet today in somber times. Somber not just in the devastation wrought by these vile and barbarous acts of terrorism which we witnessed in New York and Washington this week, but somber also in the threat implicit in what we witnessed for the rest of the civilized world. What we saw on Tuesday with such disbelief was not an attack just on innocent people, not just on the centers of power, but on the values of humanity which form the very basis 
of civilization across the world. This was not just an attack on America. It was an attack on the whole free world, the whole civilized world. And it is right, therefore, and I congratulate the Prime Minister on this, that Parliament has been recalled. Today, we have set partisan politics aside. In the face of great evil, we are one Parliament and one House. The enormity of what was done on Tuesday was such that in some ways, it is now only just beginning to sink in in all its horror. To begin with, it was a terrible, almost unbelievable series of images and pictures. And only now are we beginning to understand the extent of the violent ending of life, of the families brutally shattered, and of the unbearable anguish left behind. The sheer numbers of people killed, the manner of their killing, the evilness of it all. And now as the bodies are recovered, the tragic stories emerge, and the real human horror hits us all. And if we feel growing anger and emotion, we should not be ashamed. This has with reason been described as an act of war. It is that, but it is much more. It is also a crime against humanity. And would be, we would be less than human if we were not profoundly moved. And our deep sorrow at what has been done to our friends in America is added to by the fact that there are so many British victims as well. We must all be shocked by how many British casualties there are the worst terrorist outrage we have faced. And I welcome the help that the government has announced this morning for the relatives of the bereaved. And we should not forget also the many other nationals who lost their lives, not least the many Pakistanis who were in those two towers when they collapsed. And our hearts today go out to all those who have died, all those who have lost loved ones, and all those whose lives will permanently be scarred, either physically or mentally, by this vicious crime. Many of these will be the brave heroes and heroines of the emergency and medical services, especially the firefighters, who literally risked life and limb in that hell on earth. And we pay tribute to their determination and courage. For me, they have given new meaning to that phrase, the indomitable spirit of man. We've all been touched by this dreadful event. The bond between this country and America is strong. Strong because of the values and interests we share. Strong because of the personal bonds of friendship and the family ties which exist between our two countries. But strong most of all for the times we have stood shoulder to shoulder against evil. And I welcome and support the government's swift announcement that at this time of America's need we will do so again. And I also praise the way in which the Prime Minister indicated that in the difficult and dangerous times ahead, we will support our friends, and I urge him and his government not to be shaken from this resolve. The time when we have needed America, they have helped us. At a time when America needs our help, we will help them. Amen. And I pay tribute to Lord Robertson, the Secretary General of NATO, and his Council for the resolute way in which they've invoked Article 5 for the first time in the organization's history and to the European Union, which has in no uncertain terms declared its determination to combat international terrorism. And I hope that the government will work to stiffen the spine of any of our European partners who may appear to wobble. And I welcome also the unanimous call for international cooperation to deal with terrorism, which came from the Security Council of the United Nations. Indeed, we must almost all have been warned by the almost universal condemnation from the, universe, from the international community as a whole. President Putin and Russia have been forthright in their support. States which have traditionally been hostile to the United States have condemned this vile act of terrorism. Yasser Arafat has condemned it. Libya has condemned it. The international community of nations has risen up against the perpetrators of Tuesday's atrocity. And this international response has been heartening. Heartening because if terrorism is to be driven from the face of our planet, we need, as U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell has said, to form a worldwide coalition against it. And we have a vital role to play in helping to build that coalition and, more importantly, in sustaining it. And I offer the government, Her Majesty's Opposition's, full support in its chosen path as a leader in the international community and a staunch ally to our American friends 
in the fight against this terrorist evil. The going will undoubtedly get tougher in the weeks ahead, and I urge them not to waver. And there is without doubt a reason for the almost universality of the condemnation of Tuesday's atrocity. This act of terrorism struck new levels of evil. It was of a different order. In the past, there have been hijacking of planes for the purposes of taking hostages. There have been bombings of buildings. On Tuesday, these heinous activities, for the first time, have been woven together with a devastating effect. This was no opportunist attack. This was no spontaneous act of terrorism. This had been long in the planning. This had required skilled recruitment, skilled training, and the ability to retain motivation over what was clearly a lengthy period of time. This was the work of a sophisticated organization or even possibly a state. It was a new dimension of terrorism. It was terrorism without limits. Here were terrorists for whom human life held no value. Neither their own nor those of the hundreds on the plains and the thousands on the grounds which they were to destroy. These terrorists were not mindless. I agree with the Foreign Secretary, we should be very cautious of using the word mindless. These terrorists were totally calculating and deliberate. Theirs was an attack on that set of values which believes in the sanctity of human life and in human liberty and in human rights. And theirs is a war where nothing matters except the achievement of their objectives. There is no morality and no conscience. There are real dangers in these which the civilized world has now to meet because these are the rogue elements. These are the rogue terrorists backed more often than not by rogue states. And the manner in which they deliver their terror is developing along a frightening pattern. Once it was firearms, then it was car bombs. This week it was the equivalent of flying bombs packed with people being flown into buildings packed with people designed to create the maximum loss of life. And as the Foreign Secretary has said himself today, next time it could be missiles. And if ever there has been good reason to consider the dangers of asymmetric warfare and the need for loud defense against it, it was this vile escalation of the wicked trade of the terrorist. I've listened to those who have told us that Tuesday was a day when the world was changed. And I urge caution on this. Terrorism seeks to change the world, sometimes without even having an idea of what it wants to change it to. And terrorists must not be allowed to take comfort from their action. And these terrorists must not be allowed to take comfort from Tuesday. Not even the merest glimmer of satisfaction that they have achieved any of their aim. It was Mayor Giuliani of New York who said to Manhattan soon after this terrible tragedy, go about your normal day, do the things you normally do, show confidence in yourself and the city. And terrorists may temporarily have caused an alteration of lifestyle to recognize the need for greater security, but they have not and they will not and they must not change our freedoms and our rights and the way we as free people live our lives. What has been changed by Tuesday is the way in which the free world now reacts to terrorism. There must be no more talk of discussions with and concessions to terrorists, with those who hold no human values. The simple priority now must be the pursuit and total eradication of this terrorist threat. My time in Northern Ireland taught me that terrorism depends on three elements to succeed. It needs the oxygen of publicity. It needs to show that it works. And it needs safe havens within which it can hide. As this week showed, the first cannot be prevented if the act is horrific enough. The second can be avoided by determining that terrorism must never be appeased and must never be allowed to dictate the way that lives are led. The third can only be achieved when those in whose territories the bolt holes exist are prepared to block up those bolt holes and ensure that the terrorists can find no comfort or shelter or harboring from the relentless search and destroy pursuit which the international community will launch against them. The successful terrorist, like the gorilla in Mao Zedong's famous dictum, swims like a fish in the sea of people. The challenge to the international community is to dry up that sea 
and to leave the terrorists exposed on the sand so that we can deal with them. And the significant coalition, already brought together since Tuesday, must challenge the countries of the world one by one to block up the bolt holes and ensure that the terrorist is isolated and dealt with. And those countries who demur or refuse will condemn themselves as the harbourers of terrorists who must then in turn be shown that the international community will not tolerate them. This is a war which the United States has declared on terrorism. The form it will take cannot yet be known. I hope that the Foreign Secretary can assure us that before it's decided we will be consulted upon it. I hope that he can also confirm that our government has indicated to the United States that they will have our military support and assistance if that should prove necessary. It's fruitless to speculate on what scale of military action the Americans may be planning to undertake. But I'm sure that the whole House will agree with me that it must be proportionate, it must be clearly, legitimately targeted, and it must be effective. And I'm confident that it will be. ...of inhumanity and on their accomplices and protectors. And our will must be the single-mindedly addressed to the need to bring these people to justice... Order. I ask the House to rise and observe a three-minute silence for the people of America. Order. <coughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, nothing can mitigate the sheer horror of the act we have just commemorated by our silence. But if it has mobilized the world community finally to stand up to the terrorist and to say enough is enough, 
If it has galvanized the family of nations into taking the action which can eradicate this evil from its midst, then some good may yet come of it. I offer the government our full support in the action they're taking. Yeah. 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 Mr. Campbell. Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker, not for the first time this week, I've reflected on the fact that no matter how rich or diverse the English language is, it is inadequate to convey the sense of horror and the sense of frustration which so many of us feel at the events that have taken place across the Atlantic. <coughs> uh, expressions like defining moment have been thrown about. And there are many of my generation for whom the defining moment appeared to be the assassination of John F. Kennedy. But I suspect that the life of the most powerful city in the most powerful country in the world will never be the same. Not just the irritation of increased airline security, but the realization that no country, however powerful, can guarantee absolute safety for its citizens. And after the emotions of shock and sorrow and anger has come, as the Prime Minister rightly expressed, our admiration for the people of the United States. The United States is a great country with enormous economic resources, but this week we have seen that it has great resources of character as well. How else can one explain the extraordinary unified response to these events? Immediate bipartisanship in the Congress, the quite extraordinary valor and bravery of the emergency services, and in town and village throughout the United States, public protests of determination that they will not be intimidated. In our occasionally patronizing way, Mr. Speaker, on this side of the Atlantic, we occasionally raise our eyebrows at the United States style of public affirmation of nationhood, the Pledge of Allegiance, the public support for the flag. The truth is, this week has demonstrated that in time of crisis, that public expression of unity is priceless in promoting a common purpose and a determination to triumph over adversity. And the collective response of the people of the United States has rightly earned the admiration of us all. When the roll call of nations is set down, those nations who have lost citizens, it will tell us that the nations of the whole world were the indiscriminate targets of the zealots whose barbarity has brought sadness and grief to so many families across the world. And for me and perhaps for others, the close proximity of the headquarters of the United Nations has more than symbolic significance. But we know that the heaviest burden will be borne by the people of the United States. And out of that collective sorrow from which they suffer and which we share, there must surely come a resolve that through collective action the perpetrators will be brought to justice and that terrorism will be met in all circumstances by a robust defense of democratic values. Let me try to put to rest the canard that somehow United States policy in the Middle East was the cause of these events. I've not always agreed with United States policy in the Middle East. Indeed, I've said so in the House on many occasions. But the cause of these events was a deliberate and calculated decision to take the lives of as many as possible, allied to the willingness of desperate men to implement that decision at the cost of their own lives. The Prime Minister was correct to tell us that we must not suffer any ambiguity in our analysis of terrorism. But we should also remind ourselves that terrorism often flourishes where either real or perceived injustice prevails. And communities who have an unresolved or unrecognized sense of grievance are driven sometimes to assume that terrorism is the only way of seeking resolution or recognition. 
This is not an occasion to conduct detailed analysis of policy or to try to offer long-term solutions. But let me offer two thoughts. There are governments in the Middle East today to whom these events will be a chilling reminder of the radical discontent in their own countries and who themselves have an overwhelming interest in cooperating with the efforts of the United States and others. And after the Gulf War, President Bush's father, then the President of the United States, used the quite extraordinary coalition which he had forged in order to achieve the expulsion of Iraq from Kuwait to breathe new life into the Middle East peace process. Out of that came the Madrid Conference and then the Oslo Agreement. President Bush of today has forged a remarkable coalition of interest, a coalition of condemnation. Is it too much to hope that that unity of purpose itself may again give an opportunity to repeat the effort to breathe life into the peace process in the Middle East? I cannot but conclude, Mr. Speaker, that we will more easily put down terrorism when we understand the causes of terrorism. Although I'm by no means as naive to assume that if Israel and Palestine were to strike a bargain today and to begin to implement it tomorrow, that would be an end to the terrorist threat. There are some so opposed to that reconciliation that the mere fact of the reconciliation would be a further provocation towards terrorist acts. The Prime Minister used the words brought to justice. I imagine he used that formulation deliberately. Because I have some sense of relief that the pressure for retaliation has abated. Retaliation, Mr. Speaker, is not self-defense by any legal measure with which I am familiar. The United States, as our oldest ally, our strongest ally, is entitled to our support and we have heard already of the unique invocation of Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty. But this is a sovereign House of Parliament, and this sovereign House of Parliament and this nation, even accepting the letter and the spirit of the Article 5 requirement, uh, cannot give a blank check for military action. NATO operates by consensus. And if there is to be any NATO action and implement of the Article 5 obligation, it will be action only because it is supported by all of the 19 members of that organization. And I want to suggest that any response, Mr. Speaker, should be based on clear and unequivocal intelligence, that it must not be disproportionate, and that it must be consistent with the principles of international law. And I do not rule out for a moment the use of United Kingdom forces or materiel for the purpose of such a response, if that be appropriate. <coughs> Let me conclude by saying this, Mr. Speaker. There is a risk here, a risk of what is sometimes called rich man's justice, lest by the overwhelming zeal with which we pursue the perpetrators of these terrorist acts, we give the impression that the lives of citizens of the richest countries are worth more than the lives of citizens of the poorest. And in the last 10 years, we have seen in Rwanda hundreds of thousands, incalculable numbers, massacred, a form of terrorism, if you like, while the world looked on and the United Nations uniquely had to make a formal acknowledgement of failure. And in Srebrenica, in the name of Christianity, 8,000 Muslim men and boys were massacred by units of NATO, the most successful military alliance in history, looked on. And the skies above were quiet and empty of the aircraft, which a short time before had bombed Iraq into a wasteland. Perhaps the events in New York and in Washington are a watershed. Perhaps they reflect a new beginning. Perhaps they are 
a defining moment. They will be such, Mr. Speaker, if they achieve the apprehension uh, in accordance with justice of those who are the perpetrators of the terrible act of this week. But they will also constitute a defining moment if they make the Srebrenica's and the Riandas much more difficult to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. Peter Mandelson. Given the profound and unbearable nature of what has happened this week, it is not surprising that there is a great deal of debate, quite rightly, a great deal of speculation and some hesitation about what should uh, follow next. I think the government is right, therefore, to have acted uh, so promptly and so instinctively in leading the action to internationalize uh, and coordinate a calm response uh, to the savagery that we have seen, in particular, if I may say, in drawing in the Russians. To those who worry, and I know there are some amongst my own colleagues who worry about the fall that the American retaliation uh, will take, I say that we will only influence America if we stand four square behind yeah. America at this time. But also to the American people, uh, I would say, and I do so with humility, given the grievous loss that they have uh, experienced this week, don't get mad, get even. The desire to meet this challenge with a forceful response is understood and it is shared. The need to do so in a way that defeats terrorism as well as punishes terrorism is, I think, paramount. And therefore, the uh, test of the response that will be made is not so much whether it is proportionate so much as whether it is effective. Britain has unique experience and qualifications to be listened to because we have fought terrorism uh, over very many decades uh, in Northern Ireland. And I think the main point is that terrorism is not conventional war demanding a conventional response. And this is terrorism that we are seeing now in the world of a most advanced, fanatical, and carefully planned kind. I won't, if I may. It will not be countered. It will not be countered by simple physical force. It will only be defeated by a combination of intelligence, political activity and dialogue, and international collaboration of a quality and on a scale that we have not seen before. High quality intelligence, painstakingly collected and applied over time, is at the heart of this effort to defeat a hidden enemy. This involves high tech surveillance and supreme acts of human bravery. It can't be done on the cheap. It can't be done uh, without a political framework in which uh, the work of intelligence, uh, the intelligence services depends on explicit political and ministerial authorization. And it can't be done without recruiting agents from the same communities uh, from which the terrorist organizations draw their own membership. Uh, to fight the menace of uh, fundamentalist Islamic uh, terrorism Recruitment has to be directed uh, at Muslim and Arab-speaking communities. The James Bonds of the future, Mr. Speaker, are not going to be found in the, in the Travelers Club and the Athenaeum. Uh, they are going uh, to be found on the streets of Bradford and Marseille. As a high priority, therefore, we should be looking at how we extend intelligence uh, cooperation. There is close UK-USA cooperation, and I would not wish to see this undermined in any way. But European partners should not fall short of their responsibilities. They cannot opt out, including the Russians. Informal cooperation already exists. The question is how we make this more effective. A new EU or multinational anti-terrorism agency would need to work within a clear structure of political accountability. Uh, it would need to have a, a political head appointed and accountable to participate in governments. 
But then having put this framework in place, it should have its independence and autonomy to act without constant reference back. Then we have to re-examine the balance between civil liberties and the fight against terrorism. And I think that my right honorable friend, the Home Secretary, uh, spoke with great sense and judgment uh, on the radio uh, this morning. So in terrorist cases, we need to accept new extraterritorial powers for the police to make arrests outside their own country. We need a new international court, like the court established at The Hague to fight war crimes. And we need acceptance in that court of evidence gained by covert means. And there are other steps we need uh, to take as well. Seizing assets of terrorists and their associates unhindered by bureaucracy. We need an international organization to supervise this. Mr. Bin Laden is a very wealthy man <coughs> indeed, and he doesn't keep his money in an Afghan bank account. We need to enhance to our own security. We need to, it's time I think uh, for us to look again at the, at the case for identity cards. We have to ensure that with EU enlargement, we have an effective common border with not just border checkpoints, but effective high-tech surveillance to monitor and control movements across that common border. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, as well as strengthening security, we need to address the legitimate grievances of the communities from which terrorists draw their recruits, as we have done in Northern Ireland. And we must renew our efforts to tackle the causes of the conflict in the Middle East. The US must re-engage in the Middle East peace process as a high priority. The aspirations of both Israel and Palestinians must both be recognized, just as the Good Friday Agreement uh, serves both nationalist and unionist traditions in Northern Ireland. So intelligence, political dialogue and activity, and international cooperation underpinned by appropriate and timely use of force. There are no magic solutions to the terrorist challenge we face, but this is the only course we must take. And I have to say, we face a very long haul in doing so. Yeah. Order. I should inform the House that with effect from 11.30 this morning, I have authorised the placing in the library of a book of condolence in memory of those who died in the tragic events in the US this week. Uh, the book will be available for members and staff of the House. Order. John Butterfield. Mr. Speaker, uh, I think all of us, of course, are, are, are still numb uh, from the unspeakable events that have occurred in the United States. And we must all agree uh, that it is essential that we pursue the culprits and we ensure that they are brought to justice. And I have to say, there's one who has voted consistently <laughs> against capital punishment for all the time that I've been in this House. My convictions in that regard are now being very sorely tested. But I don't think that it is the misguided fanatics who carried out this event and who lost their own lives in the process who are the real culprits. The real culprits are the bigoted, warped, evil people who led them to believe that they were pursuing the cause of some religious objective in carrying out what they did. It is those people we need to seek out. It is those people who are the real guilty people. And they must be brought to justice themselves. And any regime that supports them must eventually be removed from power by the international community. And I think that we need to plan that process extremely carefully. It is not the case that this is the fault of Islam, as many speakers have said. Uh, I'm afraid that all major religions have suffered from this same fanatic bigotry and fundamentalism. And if we look at the history of Christianity itself, we can see many, many examples of appalling behavior in the name of Christianity. Indeed, we only have to look at Northern Ireland today 
to see what religious bigots can do to one another in the name of their religion. And the same applies to the Jewish faith, where we have fundamentalists, bigots in Israel today, who have delayed irreparably uh, the cause of peace between the Jews and the Palestinians. And this cause uh, in Islam is one that threatens not just the Western world, but threatens all the democratic Islamic states. And there are many of them who are under threat from this same group of people. And if we look at Egypt, if we look in the Gulf, if we look at Saudi Arabia, if we look at Pakistan, if we look at the former Soviet Islamic states, they are all under threat from this process. And we must make common cause with those people to ensure that these fanatics do not succeed, not simply in, in causing further mayhem in the West, but in overthrowing moderate Islamic governments wherever they may exist, because their interests coincide precisely with ours. We must ensure, therefore, that this is not seen as something between Islam and the West, but something that is uh, a common cause between all of Islam and all of, of, of the Western world. And that, is, that must be the thrust of any action which is taken uh, by the international community in the future. We must also ensure that our own banking systems do not permit the financing of these activities in the future. Mm. It's been said already by the Honourable Gentleman from Hartlepool that of course, uh, bin Laden himself has bank accounts, uh, and they're, they're not located in Afghanistan. They are located elsewhere in the world, and the international banking system has a duty to take action to prevent the transmission of funds for these evil purposes. Uh, finally, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I think that I would wish to say that we need to look at the ways in which our present uh, uh, attitude uh, towards uh, uh, immigration uh, and uh, the dealing with asylum seekers may impact upon this problem. Now, I don't think that we should do anything that prevents genuine asylum seekers from coming to this country. But we must remember that the way that our courts and those in Australia are interpreting the present legislation means that it is virtually impossible to exclude anybody from our borders. Now, uh, it is true, you see, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that some 5,000 Afghans have come to this country in the last six months. Now, of course, I believe that the majority of them are fleeing and in genuine fear of persecution from the evil regime that exists in Afghanistan at the moment. But we cannot rule out the real possibility that amongst them are terrorists here for a very different purpose. And we do need to regain control of that process if we are to protect ourselves from international terrorism. And therefore, I believe uh, that it is the duty of uh, governments here and in the European Union to review the way in which uh, the uh, legislation on human rights is framed so, so as to make it absolutely clear that it cannot be used uh, to allow terrorists to penetrate our shores. Because if we can't reform it in that way, I think we should be abrogating the treaty. Yeah. Donald Lambs. Speaker, this is a solemn occasion. This is a time for grieving for showing our horror at the number of individuals, individuals whose lives were shattered when they were going peacefully, innocently about their work. A time also to show solidarity with the people of the United States in all the reasonable actions which they might take in response. And so far, indeed, their response has been commendable. They have the American government has avoided the twin temptations of a, a reckless swipe at an unknown enemy to placate demands from public opinion 
and also avoided the temptation of uh, yielding to perhaps a, a new isolationism. Now is not the time to debate national missile defense, but surely that debate will be conducted in a new context when, when we will see that that may be a sort of Maginot line in the sky and the real danger comes from terrorists with suitcase, suitcases rather than the rogue states which are now uh, in the uh, site of the US. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I make, wish to make four brief reflections. First, how can we combat the terrorist threat on the operational level? My right honorable friend, the Prime Minister, and my right honorable friend, the Foreign Secretary, have mentioned the links with organized crime and narco-terrorism. May I also mention this, clearly with a wish to retain at all times our own <laughs> democratic values. Uh, first, the areas to examine include aviation security. I will not go into details, but clearly the threat was foreseeable and was foreseen. And I refer to the House Chapter 8 in the excellent work by Professor Paul Wilkinson of St. Andrews University called Terrorism Against Democracy, uh, published last year. The, uh, one sees the precedent, for example, in the Algerian GIA and the Airbus in France. We claim that our security is so much better with Transec and other matters, but the, the danger is known. Uh, the, the Gore Commission in the US showed the problem. The, the real problem now is implementation and enforcement, and it was not enforced because of the inconvenience factor and because of commercial considerations. Second, under this heading, we wish to ne need to look at the education of foreign nationals from sensitive areas in sensitive subjects. In 1993, the World Trade uh, Building bomber was educated in my city. We know that two of these bombers were educated in, in Hamburg. The, the, they were taught flying in Florida. Surely, we need to follow and look at the recommendation of the US National Commission chaired by Ambassador Bremner, which made relevant recommendations, which have again been ignored. I adopt what my right honorable friend, the Prime Minister, said about extradition. Second reflection, we need to tackle more energetically the world crisis areas which breed terrorists. And of course, it is mainly the Middle East, as broadly defined, where terrorism overflows regional boundaries. That there were many points of leverage which can be used on both the Israelis and the Palestinians. But obviously, we need to start a new process on firm foundations. There is no magic panacea to end terrorism, but the efforts, strenuous efforts, renewed efforts, to increase stability in volatile areas of the world will reduce the water where terrorists breed and swim. Third reflection, and uh, on the tidal wave of revulsion which follows this outrage, clearly the US needs to build a new coalition against terrorism. Uh, we have begun with the Article 5 and NATO, and as my right honorable friend has said, the important decision made at the UN Security Council on Wednesday. But that coalition will break down if the US response is deemed to be disproportionate, badly targeted, and if there is a failure to consult adequately on general policy. That would weaken the chances of a solution if one steps outside uh, the, a reasonably international solution. A related and final reflection of this. There will, of course, be some form of military response. I trust that will not be an invasion of Pakistan, where we know our topo topography, we know our history of this country in the 19th century, Afghanistan. and Afghan <laughs> Afghanistan, the, the <laughs> Afghanistan, I'm sorry, <laughs> that the, we know our history of the, the, the 19th century of the UK and the, the bleeding wound of the Russian Federal, of the Soviet Union in the 1980s. 
but certainly the military firepower has a role, but not, it is not a long-term solution. Bin Laden and his like will not be crushed by missiles or invasion. To reduce the risk, we need a subtle combination of policies, not an unbalanced military response. And that would only lead, in my judgment, to more violence, to more deaths, and it would be a gross mistake, a betrayal of our values, and wholly counterproductive. Dr. Ian Paisley. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, I regret that I had not the opportunity as a leader of a party in this House to express, uh, when the other leaders expressed uh, their condolences to those who were done to death in these terrible atrocities. I put on the record I have had an apology from the Speaker, which I accept, but I want to just associate myself with those remarks uh, that have been uh, those remarks that were made. Uh, great grief is never good at talking. The language of grief is not vocal. It is the language, the language of grief is not a vocal, it is a tear, an anguish where the depth of one human soul calls to the depth of another human soul in agony. And uh, I'd like to say that words are very weak to express how the whole nations of this earth feel at this moment in the light of what has happened. Coming from Northern Ireland, uh, where the ugly scars are still before us and where the running wounds still run. And it is interesting to note that ter terrorism in Northern Ireland, Republican terrorism, was an action at the same time. An attempt was made when the atrocities were being carried out in uh, the United States. Attempts were being made to slaughter three police officers in the city of Londonderry. And it was only providential intervention that keeps us in this house today uh, mourning those three officers. The whole world has been taught in a fiercely highlighted message <laughs> in this terrible atrocity, which leveled New York skyline to sea level and made its rubble the cruel sepulchre of thousands of unsuspecting victims. The rulers of the Western democracies must learn the lesson that criminal terrorism cannot be talked away, it cannot be dialogued with, for it is the lie incarnate, and its priests and acolytes are unchangeable liars. The killer of the young children by knifing them in one of the planes is a demonstration of that. And I do welcome what the Prime Minister has said today, that this form of terror knows no mercy, no pity, and it knows no boundaries. And I also welcome what was said by the Shadow Foreign Secretary today in keeping with those words. Terrorism has become a monstrous beast which now rages forward to torment the whole world. A new and terrible dimension has been added to the terrors of our unknown tomorrows. I would like to say that we met in this house after the awful atrocity in Oma. Uh, we had strong words and strong language. But those who mourn their loved ones in Oma and never got the action in the courts and had themselves and at the moment are raising money to bring a private a prosecution against those who are suspected. So we did not come up to the standard uh, for the Oma people. And many people will feel that after all that is said in this house today, will we? really take on this enemy and by determination and courage work uh, to take away the oxygen from it. The, the numbers have been quoted uh, by uh, the leader of the SDLP in this house. He's absolutely right. Uh, this atrocity in the United States 
measured in comparison to the population of Northern Ireland is very minor. Take the figures and you will know that. We have been enduring this matter on the same level and more, day in and day out. And yesterday in the, Norman, in the Stormont Assembly, we weren't even allowed uh, to put an amendment to the motion before the Assembly because of the, the love to get some sort of consensus. Uh, I resent that. I believe that anything that is dealt with, uh, there should be an opportunity uh, to deal with it thoroughly from every point of view. And I'm glad in this House there has been given this opportunity with the recall of this House for us to, to state uh, what our views are. I believe that we must come down uh, to a grim determination that come what may, we must act against these terrorists so that people throughout the whole world uh, can not fear of what's going to happen on the morrow. That is a very tall order. It's not going to happen overnight, but that must be the objective. And for any to suggest now that this is an unwinnable war, a war that cannot be won, then that takes uh, from the very heart of determination and the very heart of hope among the people of this planet. This war must be won. This war must be pursued with all the activity of energy and determination and resolution. And I resent the remarks made against President Bush. I don't believe he ran away. And I think it was disgraceful that that would be suggested. Those of us who are under police protection, as I have been for 30 years, don't like it. And we're told there are places we can't go, and we have to obey that. And it's not because I wouldn't want to go to places. I have had great arguments with my protection officers, and have said, as long as we're protecting you, we will tell you where you should go and where you shouldn't go. And they have to watch themselves as well. And I think that this House should salute the President of the United States, wish him well, and join with others in prayers that these sores and wounds will be eased. And someday soon we will see the shining of a better sun on this world and a shedding a beautiful rainbow over this awful valley of tears we're in at the moment. Thank you. Mr. Tam Diel. May I have a quiet word with my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, and my friend of 35 years. He referred to turning the other cheek. Well, you know, it's not quite like that. We have to make up our minds whether we are concerned with vengeance and eradication, quote, unquote, or, on the other hand, preventing such ghastly happenings ever occurring again. And I'm directed to the latter. We have to ask ourselves, where do evil organizations recruit people who are prepared to take planes into skyscrapers? And I think I know part of the answer. And I'll put it this way. In 1998, with the former Taoiseach, Albert Reynolds. I went to Baghdad, and we were invited of an evening to the house of Tariq Aziz. And Tariq Aziz rather movingly said to us, he said, you may think that Saddam and I are extremists. We are as nothing to what will follow if these sanctions and this bombing goes on. And the truth is that there is a generation in Iraq and indeed elsewhere in the Middle East that whether we like it or not, unpalatable though it may be, is growing up absolutely to loathe 
the United States, and Britain. And of course, this is a pool of quote-unquote talent from which people can be recruited to do desperate and evil things. And we do have to ask ourselves, to what extent a candid friend of the United States, and candid friends can be a great nuisance, to what extent is the hatred of America due to very aggressive American foreign policy? Now, reference was made to Libya and Lockerbie. The, the Prime Minister has a letter from the Reverend John Mosey of the Lockerbie relatives, a very balanced, decent man, who says it was American aggressive foreign policy that killed my daughter. That is a matter of record and his opinion. And I think we have to be very careful of assuming that there are a great number of people in this country who want vengeance. They want it stopped from ever happening again. And therefore, I have one concrete suggestion. It may be very unpalatable. I would ask the Foreign Secretary to look again at this whole Iraq policy. I happen not to think, I may be wrong, that the government of Iraq had anything to do with it. What one suspects is that there are people from all over the Middle East, a very tightly knit group, who because of what they've seen happening in Palestine and elsewhere, are prepared to go to desperate lengths. Now, unless we address this problem, then it will happen again. And I simply ask the Foreign Secretary, for God's sake, look at 10 years of bombing of Iraq and sanctions. Sir Patrick Cormack. Mr Deputy Speaker, the, uh, the House always listens with uh, great interest and respect to what the Father of the House says, and we all ho hold him in very high and affectionate regard. And uh, we can understand why he spoke as he did. But I think, if I say with great respect to him, he does underestimate the anger that is felt throughout the world at this despicable series of atrocities. And I have rarely found the House more united in grief and in anger or in resolve. This debate does recall, in some respects, that debate we had on a Saturday morning in April 1982, just after the Falkland Islands had been invaded, when the then opposition of the day gave uh, the virtually unqualified support to the government of the day on the back of that, the successful expedition of the Falklands was launched. Now, of course, it is crucial as we give support to the government, which we do unreservedly, it is crucial that the government uses its influence in the councils of the world to ensure that any response is measured and accurate and properly directed, because we do not want to compound this appalling series of dreadful deeds by the making of more innocent orphans. And that, I think, is something else that the House would be united on. And I would just, in the very brief time that I have, and it's right that we're all restricted, like to direct the attention of the Foreign Secretary or the Secretary of State for Defense, who will be responding, to one suggestion, and it is this. All the talk of international cooperation, so far, so good. But out of this, something definite and specific must emerge. What we need is an international convention akin to the Geneva Convention. What we need is a convention to which all members of the United Nations are obliged to subscribe. A convention which says that the harboring of terrorists, the nurturing of terrorism, is something that will never be accepted, and nations that are refused to subscribe to this should frankly forego any rights to United Nations assistance, and indeed their votes at the United Nations General Assembly itself, and they should know that they would be regarded by the other nations of the world 
as legitimate targets should they indeed harbor terrorists. Because uh, these people, evil and motivated as they are, cannot succeed without some state in which they base themselves. Now, I do not know whether the speculation that uh, bin Laden is responsible is right. I do not know whether the speculation that Saddam Hussein is very involved in this is right. I regard both of those as entirely plausible theories. And it is perfectly possible that both of those theories are right. And if they are, it is entirely right that those countries should feel the wrath of the international community. But it does, of course, have to be in a measured way. Uh, and we have to be as careful as possible that the innocent are not slaughtered in the process. But we have to root out this cancer of terrorism from the world. It's going to be a very long, long job. There is, as somebody has said, no absolute and ultimate defense against the suicide bomber ab who is hell-bent on mayhem and destruction. Well, we have to make his task as difficult as possible, and our intelligence services have to be as sophisticated and as alert as possible. And one way, and it's only one way, but it is a specific suggestion and a particular thought, one way is to create an international convention, as I've said, to which every member of the United Nations is required to subscribe. Detailed and specific. And just as it is regarded by almost every nation, and it is very rarely broken, the way in which prisoners of war and so on are treated under the Geneva Convention, so there should be such a convention binding the nations of the world in as a partial step to overcoming and eventually eradicating this monstrous evil. Yeah. Yeah. Mohammed Saab. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is hard to comprehend or to come to terms with the tragedy and staggering death toll that has been inflicted upon the American people and other nationals. Our hearts and thoughts are with all those who have lost friends and family. People of all nationalities and faiths have perished in this meaningless atrocity. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I speak on behalf of my constituents in Glasgow government and undoubtedly on behalf of the Muslim community in this country and beyond. When I say that this barbaric and inhuman terrorist atrocity must be condemned unreservedly. We would solidly support all legitimate efforts to bring the perpetrators to justice. Whoever the culprits transpire to be, it is critical that we send a clear message that they cannot possibly claim to represent the true interests of any religious or ethnic group. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have seen in the recent past how hysteria can be whipped up at the times of tragedy and corrosive effect that this ultimately has on society. It is for this reason that I support the Prime Minister in his clear message on the dangers of stereotyping communities and in particular the Muslim community. With these words, my right honorable friend has given comfort to people in this country and across the world. It is critical that even in giving support to any action, we do so observing the principles of justice and within the framework of international law. While we must naturally give our support to American allies, we must counsel against unilateral action. We must also avoid action that could result in the deaths of thousands of other innocent civilians, perpetuating the cycle of violence. We cannot afford to isolate any of our allies in finding solutions. And in particular, if there is evidence that Osama bin Laden is responsible, then our allies 
who recognize the Taliban government, namely Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and the United Arab Emirates will be crucial in influencing the situation. It is a difficult time, but I believe it is the right time to examine more deeply our role and responsibilities within the world. We must also attempt to understand why it is that some extremists feel driven to the abhorrent madness we have witnessed in New York and Washington. There can be no justification for this vulgar terrorist atrocity, but at the same time, we cannot be blind to the plight of oppressed people who look to Europe and the USA for support. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as a former colonial power, we have a special responsibility. We should use our influence with the Americans and other allies to redouble our efforts in search of just solutions to outstanding issues in the Middle East and other parts of the world. This brutal terrorist attack is profoundly contrary to the doctrine of Islam and as such has been strongly condemned by Muslim states, Muslim clerics, and individual Muslims throughout the world. I can only reiterate that condemnation. And on behalf of all my constituents, express my hope that the international community can achieve justice for the innocent victims and grieving families. Yes. Yes. Mr. Julian Brazier. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Yes. The government, in its response to this, has followed in the courageous tradition of Clement Attlee when he took this country, then economically almost destitute and war wary, put us firmly behind America with the emergence of the Korean crisis. In speaking to my many American friends, I'm expressing admiration as well as grief. Admiration particularly for the heroes in the New York emergency services and for those, among others, who fought on that fourth plane to prevent a fourth major tragedy from taking place. There will be two pillars, it seems to me, that are critical to making a coalition to see this business through work. The first pillar will be among moderate Arab and Islamic opinion. I remember when I was working in Bahrain, the single smartly dressed guard with his bayonet fixed who stood at the door of every service of the mass at the church I attended, the emir's personal guarantee of religious freedom. We must carry with us the moderate Islamic and Arab world and I can think of nobody better to build and solidify that coalition than Colin Powell. Yeah. Central to that challenge will be convincing those Arab leaders that we in the West are as concerned about the plight of the Palestinians as we are about the right of the Israeli state to exist in peace. The other crucial pillar will be the relationship with Moscow. We barely said thank you for the generous support the Russians gave us at the end of the Kosovo crisis in defusing what could have otherwise become a bloodthirsty war. Russia's history in Afghanistan pre the fall of the communists is an extremely unhappy one and my support for an Afghan charity for 20 years goes back to those evil days. But that was long ago. President Putin's generous and immediate response on this must be acknowledged, thanked and seen as a crucial part of the process. Let me just turn for a moment, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to the military side. I urge the government in the strongest possible and most unpartisan way to go back to our very assumptions on defence policy. Assumptions which, I make no secret of it, grew out of the views of almost the whole of the younger defence establishment. Assumptions that the whole of our defence capability should be vested in an expeditionary capability, itself vital, and that we could marginalized except on a very small scale considerations of home and civil defense. 
As we look across at the United States, it wasn't just courage in the New York emergency services, it was also coordination and regular rehearsal and planning. Something which is so lacking over here and has been under governments of all descriptions in recent years that in my county, as in so many others, the software and frequencies of our various emergency services are not even compatible. Our, our, our control centers can't even talk directly together, let alone talk to the military. And as we see some 2,000 National Guard units and subunits in America, representing nearly 400,000 men and women, many cases being mobilized and others waiting to be mobilized, let's just remember that for all its problems, the American military can not only mount a huge expeditionary force and reinforce it, they can also defend their home base with vast numbers of part-time local personnel available in a whole range of functions from infantrymen through to NBC specialists and engineers. So I ask the government, we must have an all-party thought, a, 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 an all-party reconsideration in which the Defence Select Committee, whose excellent chairman, my close friend, the Honourable Member for Walsall, will no doubt play a critical role when he made a remarkable speech, there isn't time to quote from it now, predicting this sort of problem three years ago. Mr Deputy Speaker, we're in for a long, ugly haul on this. This is not something which is going to be resolved by the pressing of a few missile buttons or the sending in of bombers. This is going to be a long, difficult, agonizing process. I believe that the government, my honorable friends on the opposition front benches, and almost all the members who've spoken in the House today have got this nation started to the best, the most resolute, and the most sensible course of action. Mr. Bruce George. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, I would like to thank the Honourable Member for his uh, kind comments, and I, would, and I hope he doesn't think I'm patronising him in any way by congratulating him on his, on his courage in speaking today. We were all voyeurs of a catastrophe, willing voyeurs, and rushing in front of our television sets and pinning our eyes to something quite surrealistic. I, I thought it was computer generated, but planes flying into the towers, couldn't believe it was true. We're so used to seeing simulated death on television. I half expected King Kong to appear at the, the top of the tower, and it, one had to remind ourselves that this was a catastrophe unfolding before our, our very eyes. And when the towers imploded, for every second of the few seconds that those towers disappeared downwards, you knew a thousand people had died. We were spared two real television. Maybe in future, there will be television cameras inside an aircraft about to penetrate concrete. So we can see <coughs> the grief and the terror in people's eyes as they are about to face inevitable death. What we saw there will be with us forever. We all have images, positive and negative, that we recall forever. But with globalization of, of television, the whole world saw in grief or in ecstasy what was unfolding before our, our collective eyes. And there can be few reasonable people, whatever their background, that were not filled with horror and anger and disbelief at the fallibility and stupidity and malice of fellow human beings who not only would derive political happiness for participating in such an outrage, but would foolishly believe that their God <coughs> would reward that kind of barbarity with instant entry into some higher form of post-life. There has to be a reaction. I'm amazed that the United States, who are a very volatile people, 
have not demanded instant gratification for their, for their anger. When I heard on television that very evening that bombs were heard in Kabul, I, I, I trembled that this catastrophe would become an even worse catastrophe. And I, I was relieved, relieved and in a way surprised that the United States president, a man of limited experience in international relations, didn't take to his bunker out of cowardice. He, he was away from the action for a while, planning what further catastrophe would it have been. Not only had the White House been taken out, but its president taken out simultaneously. So I deprecate those, those, those remarks. What I think is, is important is that we, we, we do, and the Prime Minister, I think, has been absolutely right, and it is so right that he has had almost unanimous support. Our chamber is configured to encourage adversity. It is compulsory, not helpful to be adversarial. And our political culture encourages us even further. But every now and again, we rise above it. I don't attack homogeneity or consensus. I, I, I thrive in it. We did rise above the, the heat of battle in 1939, 1940, 1980, the Gulf War, bombing of Bosnia, Kosovo. Of course, there were those who dissented, and I, 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 I support their right to dissent dissent from what is a consensus, but not everybody is grieving. For those of us that watched uh, David Dimblesby show last night, we can clearly real, realize that the depth of anti-Americanism that exists in this country, amongst the minority and elsewhere, and those who have said, and I reiterate it as someone who represents Hindus, Muslims, uh, uh, Sikhs, religions of, of all descriptions, I hope without indulging in the politics of gesturalism, we can publicly in our constituencies empathize, sympathize, support those Muslims who aren't a party to this by, by going to a mosque. And it's not just as a gesture. I certainly will. So I can explain to Muslims who may disagree with, with my views that, look, you are not a party to this. And whatever the cause that is being espoused by terrorists, then nothing, no cause, should precipitate the kind of action that we saw and condemned. Yes, there will be action by the US, by others. The Defense Committee in 1998 said that an Article 5 action within NATO might well be activated by terrorism, and we were prophetic in what we said. But if NATO is in some way informally involved, it could provide a break on the United States because if we are involved and we, we have, if not a veto, we have a voice. But I, I, I'm satisfied the United States and George Bush is, wants to do what his old man did, and that is to build up a consensual approach to resolve an enormous crisis. Because if it is seen as a unilateral American action, it will be condemned and people will take the perspective of uh, uh, equality, in other words, one, one disaster, one obscenity was, was matched by another. And it must be to a degree proportionate. And, and, and it must identify those who perpetrated the act. And those who would want to, to read, then read the book by a wonderful uh, a journalist on the last bombing on the Twin Towers. The investigation took a long time, from Swansea to Baluchistan but the villains were apprehended. We shouldn't expect immediate fixes. We watch too much television, and we think that perhaps a, a crime that begins in minute one is going to be solved by the time we get up and make the tea or, or, the, or the takeaway arrive. Life isn't like that, so the U.S. should be cautious. And when they have able, they've been able to prove to their own population and to a skeptical, in some ways, a skeptical world, then I'm sure they will act. Lessons to be derived. Well, the manuals on intelligence failures will have to be rewritten. Those who are complacent about security will have to look again, even if they think their security is very good. I've been along to the FAA in Washington. I've seen the reports of appalling security uh, at, at airports. Well, those people who, who brought about a dilution of the commission headed by Al Gore will now be feeling sick 
and maybe the share values in their companies will be plummeting because they put commercial pressures before the security of their passengers. To, to have your security penetrated once in a decade is a disaster. To have two major airline security penetrated four times simultaneously is bordering on criminal negligence and those who are a party to that and can you blame the security guards? However sophisticated your technology is, your system is as good as the security guard. That was uh, had his time. Dr Julian Lewis. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On Wednesday afternoon, my constituency chairman, Maureen Holding, learnt that two of her cousins had almost certainly been killed in New York. They were a brother and sister. Christine Egan was 55. She had devoted her professional life to helping and caring for deprived communities in the United States and Canada. She was visiting her brother, Michael Egan, who was 51. He phoned his wife after the impact of the plane in the tower of the World Trade Center where he was working. He said that he hoped to be home soon. He had taken out two parties of his employees. He was a highly respected vice president of an insurance company based there, and he was just going to go back and get the last batch of employees out, uh, and then he would be hoping to return home. She never heard from him again, because of course, the building imploded shortly afterwards. It is almost self-defeating, and certainly pointless, to talk about what measures of retaliation should be considered in public before they have been decided upon, let alone carried out. What I would say is that there has been too much concentration in America in particular on purely technical methods of punishing aggressive groups, societies, or even countries. You cannot wage counteraction or even counter warfare without putting your own armed forces, human lives at risk. And that is why they will have to be very careful in considering what measures they take. But something which can be discussed in advance, in public, are the measures that may be necessary to protect free and open societies against the sort of onslaught which we have seen carried out in America and which may well be visited on the rest of us quite soon. For example, I don't know if it occurred to anybody else, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but I had a twinge of unease when listening to the radio this morning, when it was being stated how Westminster Abbey would be open to all for the memorial service at 11 <coughs> o'clock, and that anybody could simply come along and join in, and they were reserving only a certain section for the dignitaries. And I just thought to myself, what would happen if a terrorist suicide bomber chose to avail himself of an opportunity like that. Now that would have been dismissed as paranoic a week ago. It can't be dismissed as paranoic now. During the last great conflict in which this country was involved, various severe restrictions on what are known today as civil rights or human rights had to be employed. And I certainly believe that serious attention will now have to be given to a number of measures. One will be the introduction of national identity cards yeah, yeah, by yeah, compulsion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another will be the consideration of setting up a comprehensive DNA database, not just something brought about when people stray into areas of illegality, but something which in, will enable the tracking of suspected terrorists from site to site, from den to den, from location or safe house to the point at which they are ready to act. Another point which the government must be aware of is the need that, to realize that they may have to have emergency powers if an onslaught of this sort begins in this country a country analogous to the internment powers that have been used in previous conflicts. When we are talking about the hijacking of aircraft, let us remember that there is one country whose aircraft are never hijacked, 
and that is Israel. Partly it is because of in increased security, but primarily it is because that when hijacking was originally attempted on those aircraft, the armed guards on those aircraft eliminated the hijackers on the spot. And Israel is now probably the safest country for airliners in which to travel. And we have to have the powers, which I was delighted to hear the Foreign Secretary refer to in his excellent speech today, to ensure that if action has to be taken against somebody who is in the process of hijacking an airliner, the government will not then find itself sued for infringing the human rights of the would-be murderer who has perhaps been shot in being yeah, prevented yeah, yeah. from committing his crime. Now, if all this sounds draconian, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is precisely because those are the measures which open societies have to take when they are under attack. Would, would the, my honourable friend give way? I'm grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. Uh, he's aware that I have several thousand of my constituents working in Canary Wharf and in the city and travelling up every day. Does he accept that Scotland Yard and the various security forces have a job to do now to make sure that their environment is safe? They, they do have indeed a job to do to ensure that, but they cannot do it if their hands are tied behind their back by legal inhibitions which would render any effective counteraction yeah, yeah. impossible. Yeah, yeah. And I have regard, when talking about an open society, to that great work of the late Sir Karl Popper, The Open Society and Its Enemies, in which he referred to something which was entitled The Paradox of Tolerance. And the paradox of tolerance states this, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that in a free society, you must tolerate all but the intolerant. Because if you tolerate the intolerant, then the conditions for toleration disappear and the tolerant go with them. Yeah, yeah. It is an act of war that has been perpetrated and we must consider very carefully whether the measures in response must be judged by peacetime standards or by the standards that obtain when a country is fighting to preserve its life. I was fascinated to hear that the Taliban in Afghanistan had been saying categorically that bin Laden could not have been responsible. If that was not a tacit admission by them, that they know of the things for which he is and is not responsible, I don't know what is. Mm, and point. has anybody else noted, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that 24 hours before the attack in America, General Massoud, the leading Excellent. freedom Excellent. fighter in Afghanistan, first against the Soviets, then against the Taliban, was the victim of a suicide bomb attempt that was meticulously, carefully, and skillfully planned. I do not believe that that was a coincidence. I am sure there is a connection between that event and what followed a day later in New York. I conclude, Mr. Deputy Speaker, by saying this. If action is taken, it must be taken wholeheartedly to the bitter end. We do not want another Gulf War yeah, where yeah. the people who are responsible mm. are left in power so that they can go on funding and functioning and committing evil through the medium of others. Yeah.